Hi guys, welcome to the Pitch Black Founder Stories. Um, lucky enough to be here today with Jock Fairweather, who's the founder and CEO, or El Capitano, Capitan, whatever it is, Capitano. of Capitano, of LT2, or Little Tokyo 2, which is Australia's biggest entrepreneurial community. I'll let, give, I'll let him give you the, the elevator pitch on them, but he's done some awesome stuff. He has an amazing story, so we're lucky to have him here today to, to learn a little bit about what he's learnt. Um, and what's going on in his life so far. But do you want to just start off by just give us a little bit of a, an elevator pitch on what LT2 is, what you're about? So if you want to say LT2 that. first, then story? Yeah, LT2 first. Okay, cool. So Little Tokyo 2 is divided up into to two major sections, really. So Little Tokyo 2 is a space. Um, it's kind of like a service office on steroids. Yeah. Uh, but we pitch and we base our entire sort of offering around a vetted community of entrepreneurs or, or passionate people, I yes. suppose. So we vet people based on passion and personality, um, not on the size of the business or the industry that they're in. And we have a pretty heavy vetting process because one bad egg can ruin the time of 500 or so, which is how many uh, businesses we've got in LT2 now. Sure. Uh, so what we offer them is obviously space to come in one day or seven days a week in offices and, and hot desk environments as they please. Uh, but what, we, what we've been able to do is force them into situations, friendly situations, where they collaborate, start startups, and end up producing really interesting uh, organic success stories, of which we've had 16 so far. Sure. Uh, we've got a 0% fail rate, 34 groups have outgrown us, which means gone past eight staff members. Um, we've facilitated about 16 investments so far. Cool. Uh, and it's been a very ad hoc process. Um, so people come and they sit, sit down with us and they basically ask for anything they might need uh, to jump over a hurdle or to reach whatever their goal they've set with us is. And we pretty much have a Rolodex of almost any connection to Australia, I'd say. I'm probably one call away. Sure. Um, and we do that as well as we have a mentor in every space, every day, every week. Cool. Um, How many spaces are there now? So we're about to open our fifth space. Um, so that's a tender that we won with the Brisbane City Council and, and Brisbane Marketing. So it's going to be Australia's premier startup and entrepreneurial space. Um, so we were lucky enough to win that and invite Fishburners to be part of it with us um, to host tech startups, which is what they're great at. Um, and then we've got Springfield, Spring Hill, Petrie Terrace, and we run the State Library of Queensland Business Studio as well with entrepreneurs and residences and, and programs. Sure. So we start off with space, it was a really organic process. And it was basically, like I think any startup is, very opportunity based. Mm. So we're super opportunistic, the tender for the city came up, so we went after that and we won that, so we started heading in that direction, right? Sure. And it's been 20 months now uh, that we've been going, uh, since we opened our doors. And it's now time for us to start actually taking some structure, and after winning uh, those, those last two tenders, um, we suddenly got a big profile, if not the biggest profile in Australia now, probably second or in line with fish burners maybe. Uh, and big enterprise started approaching us because sure. we, we obviously got validation through that. Although we'd already had those wins, we got to the stage where now a city recognises what you've done for them uh, and they want to be a part of it and support you. And all of these enterprise level companies started approaching us. Um, some in health, some in travel and tourism, uh, some in energy, some in fintech, uh, and some in s smart cities. Uh, so that is, that is a bit of a, a combination of IoT, big data, energy, um, telcos. And they all want ROI, future proofing, CSR, uh, internal problem solving. So we've come up with a way that uh, basically on a retainer, we can one fund our high school and university programs while doing due diligence, searching, and auditing of startups that the enterprise are interested in, sure. so that they can back them into programs of which they, you know, pay a fee for, um, and and they basically get this huge risk adverse portfolio of startups they get to look at and invest in the ones they think they can accelerate uh, with, what doing, yeah. without taking IP. Um, so we've got that. And then the third part, so that's Little Tokyo 2, that's Thunder Lizards. So we've got space and community, mm -hmm. we've got impact, and then we've got Superloop, uh, which is basically the funnel and the, the connecting platform between all of our 
all of all of the companies um, that are in our ecosystem. Super is an app, is that right? Yeah. Super is an app and a, and a web app. Yeah. Um, and basically, we have mental booking, space booking, room booking, chat, all these things. But we've started working with machine learning and a lot of different things that we're going to add layers into the platform. Cool. Um, and in February next year, we start onboarding all of our partner organisations. Mm -hmm. Um, because we have a, a big vetting process, it's important to us that it's not B to C, it's B to B. Um, because groups like the Australian Israel Chamber of Commerce or Pitch Black or Fish Burners already tick the boxes that we tick for our organization, mm -hmm. uh, plus or minus a few. And so we onboard them, they pay a very small amount for each of their users, and they get access to event management systems, chat, all the analytics. Um, feeds all the all the news and content that we produce, cool. and then they work up the program. Uh, sorry, they work up uh, the different layers or tiers of the app until they could, if they wanted to be part of Little Tokyo, and then get access to all of the resources that we've been able to build over the last um, two years. And in, in that way, we can be maybe for Southeast Queensland the entrepreneurial support system, mm -hmm. um, maybe for Australia, who knows? Um, but. So it's really easy. We work. We work three months in three months sprints. So in the next six months, Australia is not in that. Yeah, it's gonna take time. <laughs> but a couple of other spaces are. So yeah, that's really. where we're at. And you're so you, you created this ecosystem now, which of which Pitch Black is part of it as well, mm. um, doing separate things to each other. But your the way your story started out was really different. Uh, de I definitely don't think when you were. 15, 16, you would have imagined yourself doing this now. It's a, it's mm. a very different path. So, right back to the start, talk, talk us about, I guess, getting out of school and what you, you first did straight out of school. How did, how did this journey start uh, initially, this entrepreneurial thing? Yeah, know? so I think my maybe entrepreneurial essence or, or values or drive uh, came from my parents, uh, who are both entrepreneurs and have been almost their whole lives. Yes. Uh, and then also where I grew up, I grew up in Papua New Guinea. Um, I lived on a wooden floor with eight native kids with pillows. And that's literally how I grew up. Pidgin, uh, which is a native language, Papua New Guinea is my first language. Um, and then we moved to Manila, uh, which is also a developing world country, or was at that time, um, but a very different one. Mm. And so through the first 12 years of my life, that's kind of what I knew, um, this sort of hustle, sort of land, um, <laughs> where, where, where I didn't, I didn't appreciate objects, it didn't mean anything. You know, we used to play in the rainforest, that was our fun. Um, and we used to play with rubber bands just to make up ridiculous games because there's no Xbox, no iPads, none of that. Cool. So it taught me to be really creative, I suppose, and, um, and really appreciate life, I think. Um, and I went through school, and throughout school I played uh, three computer games professionally. <laughs> uh, and I also played a very, very high level of rugby and water polo. Yep. I broke my back playing rugby so I couldn't do sport and all the computer games because you've got to be sort of highly active um, playing computer games, as stupid as that sounds. Uh, and throughout my entire life, for whatever reason, I'd always drawn women's shoes. I have no idea why, but I could show you a picture of a licorice-inspired pair of heels I drew when I was four. <laughs> Legit, I could show you that. Um, anyway, so I was lying in, in the hospital bed, uh, and I just started drawing shoes again. And at that time, I kind of was jostling between shoe design and going to SAS, which was a huge dream of mine Two very different for, a, for a long time. <laughs> and um, anyway, I applied to London College of Fashion, took me six goes to get in. Uh, but I got in, Friday night they called me, Monday morning I flew there. Uh, and probably the crux of my time at London College of Fashion was based around two things. One was getting to know the engineers um, and the technicians in that space. Because I knew they'd been there for 30 years and they taught all of the most famous designers how to make shoes. And they kept all of those connections. So that was my in um, for who you know in, in fashion, which is very, very important, especially in luxury. And the second thing I did was I approached a, a shoe manufacturer just outside of London. And I, I knew that to produce a shoe collection, um, it would cost maybe £200,000 off the bat. Obviously, I didn't have that money. Mm -hmm. I was working after uni, after hours, so that I could pay for my food and beer um, and living, of course. So I was really strapped. Um, and it taught me how to work hard because I, I didn't have my mom washing my clothes and so on, just like I did when I was at high school here in Brisbane. And 
I said to that, anyway, I said to that shoe factory, I said, for the next three and a half years while I'm studying at London College of Fashion, I'll work for you Saturday and Sunday, eight hours for, for free. I'll do whatever you want, I don't care. But after three and a half years when I want to produce my first collection, you'll make the entire thing for free in return. And they said, cool. Um, and so I did that, presented my final collection to a board of buyers of London College of Fashion, um, sort of VCs and so on. And for the first time in history, all three of those stores bought into my collection. So I put them into a suitcase and I just wheeled it around Europe and basically harassed people until they'd take my shoes. Um, was like, that hard to get into the store uh, was, as a new designer? It was horrific. Yeah. Um, I didn't have marketing, I didn't have collateral, I didn't have lookbook, I had nothing. How old were you at this time? Um, at that point I would have been 19. So just a kid rocking at, around Europe. 19, like, yeah, literally I'd take a backpack to, to Italy and I'd just cruise around walking because um, I didn't speak Italian, trying to find manufacturers, trying to walk into stores and so on. And I basically, like, as plain as it is, I, I went into a store and I said, you take my shoes on consignments, you pay me after they sell, and I will literally stand in this store and sell the shoes if you want me to. I will do anything. I've risked my entire inheritance. I've risked everything. I want this more than anyone. Um, and so I sort of sold, sold that um, to them. And then what I'd do is I'd spend time in the cafes around the stores, making friends. After they'd agreed to take the shoes. And then when the shoes were being delivered, I messaged them all and say, hey, take all your friends into the store. They've just been delivered. Go and check them out. I got 100% sell out across all 25 stores in my first season. Wow. That's never been done before. Um, I got into quite a, quite a few stores, first time in luxury fashion history. Um, and it was all through just basically never giving up and having that relentless that relentless ability to just not accept a no yeah. and, and know where I wanted to be. These were high end shoes. What sort of price point? Yeah, were so in, in Australian dollars, um, we started at I think eight ninety nine and they That's went up to fifth yeah, fifteen ninety nine. Um, so obviously eight hundred and ninety nine I mean. Um, and then after the first season, um, I was in Geneva visiting my mum, who was consulting WHO. And anyway, I, I just met this guy really randomly, and he was starting a, a luxury fashion conglomerate, which is like an LVMH, but in Switzerland. So buying up all these fashion brands had a, you know, a sole back end. So they had uh, lawyers, accountants, product managers, sales staff, the works. Yeah. Um, and I told him the story, I showed him the shoes, I, I designed over, overnight was it 180 pairs for all of the collections that he just bought. Like, I would do anything to get involved with this. Mm -hmm. It was like a dream situation. Um, and then, honestly, within three days, um, I sold them the majority of the company for a really good amount of money for a 21-year-old. Yeah. Um, and I basically became creative director of what looked to be um, what was going to be the next sort of prodigy luxury women's shoe conglomerate. Label. Yeah. No, label. Oh, label. Oh, sorry, yes. Yeah, the conglomerate was going well as well. Over the next, oh, maybe two years, it was about three seasons in total. Um, the relationships I built with the factories were different to the to the style of management the Swiss luxury company had, and we delivered late three times in a row. Went from twenty five stores back down to like four, we bought four or three, something like that. But basically, what I started with when I first ever showed my collection. Um, and I developed really bad anxiety. Uh, I basically was done. I was cool. My brain wasn't working. Mm. I wanted to come back to Australia, play golf with my mates. Ten of them had their own little businesses, a fashion label, coffee shops, graphic designers, whatever. And they all said they had the same issues, um, like with their businesses and also why they didn't have time to spend with me. Yes. Just to play golf or, or whatever it was. And they were all lonely, unmotivated, lost at home. Had no one giving direction, no one to get high fives from, no one to cry on the shoulder of, no one to be creative with, all the services spread out, whatever. And I said, I'll buy a house. Ten of you live there, I'll be your BDM. If you want to learn something, I'll bring in Adrian to talk to you about startups, whatever it may be. They said, cool. And I ended up buying Little Tokyo, the original restaurant. And it's just been this organic, I will do anything for our members process. No matter what it is, going out to find their clients, literally. Mm -hmm why we have a 0% fail rate so far, touch wood. Um, and that same essence has taken us to today, where we started.
And you're awesome. And you, you when you bought Little Tokyo, this old Japanese restaurant, it was the like oldest restaurant, old, old yeah, Japanese Australia. restaurant in Australia. Yeah, right? it was. I bought it on the fiftieth birthday. That's right. Um, you, I remember you saying you, you didn't know what co-working. You hadn't heard of co-working at that point. It was. I think it, it was, was so about new. the six month mark when I found out what we were kind of doing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, honestly, I was just doing practical problem solving in the end. Yes. It's all I was doing, and it sort of just has evolved in that same manner. An enterprise says, I have this problem, so we create a solution to their problem and then sell it to them. Yes. And off we go, and that's kind of what's got us to, to that. Yes. Practical problem solving, honestly. And you're, so obviously some, you could say some mistakes were made back in the, you had some wins in the in the fashion industry, but then there's some mistakes made, obviously through age and experience and everything. So what, right now, and I think you're enjoying what you're doing now more mm. than that industry. It's probably totally. less vain. A million times <laughs> more. But right now, for you, at, are you 26? 26. 26. So talking to yourself at 19, mm. walking around Europe with that bag, what would you? What would be the number one piece of advice you would have given to Jock back? Then seven years ago, from what you learned, no doubt about it. It's that you don't know everything, and you can't. Uh, and so, through my entire fashion career, or whatever you want to call it, pretty short-lived, I didn't have a mentor. I didn't have guides. I did nothing. I just was winging it twenty-four-seven, and I didn't know anything. Nor was I eager enough to learn about it. I just thought, you know. I was the greatest or, you know, whatever, I was going to be the greatest and I thought I could do it all on my own mm -hmm. and that for sure was my biggest ruin. Yes. I had no advice when I was selling, you know, the majority of the company. I had no advice on how to do cash flow. I didn't know anything. I didn't know anything. I was honestly mm -hmm. just full winging it uh, and, and that's why it was a disaster in the end. Um, but I think the one thing that goes missing when everybody talks about startups and failing, I suppose, I would consider what I did a failure, um, although I, I did okay out of it, I suppose, is how much accelerated learning there is uh, in, in journeys like that. Yes. And that's why I'm so interested in the youth or anyone getting involved in startups because in that, you know, two year or whatever period that was from when I started the shoe label to when it was gone or that I'd given up, in that, in that period, I learned more than I did for sure in the 20 years of my existence or what most people in their lives learn in business by the time they're 40, yeah, right? And I was, I was 21. To have that kind of experience is, you can't pay for that. Yes. And so you and I are both looking at doing, or you, you've done a bit before, but we're both dabbling now in investing into startups, the early stage startups. Um, so what, for the entrepreneurs that are watching now, what what do you think makes a great entrepreneur? Because we, we hear great ideas every day mm. and we we meet all these people that seem great, um, like great people with great ideas and there's such a high volume of them. What what do you look at, out for now in, first in person, but then second in the idea that makes you attracted to considering helping them, obviously, and you help a lot of startups, but then also at a deeper level investing, um, which you're doing a bit of now as well. I think there's, I think for uh, an entrepreneur or a founder, uh, let's go with that, there's three key things I look for, and one is personability, and I think that could be broken down into a few things, but it's basically how you can relate to other humans. Um, because the, the number one reason startups fail is not making enough sales, right? Not enough cash flow. And the second, the second one is like, founding teams breaking up, and they both come down to what kind of person you are, and how you can relate to people, for sure. Yeah, the second thing is, I think just like I mentioned earlier, just being relentless, like not having a give up gene. I think the mantra I live by for my whole life and have is burn the boats, which means you know, you, you've know you gone into Gallipoli or whatever, and you've just flamed all your boats because there's only one way we're going, and we're going to win no matter what. Like, mm -hmm. I would risk everything, every single day, and I do, as much as my team thinks I'm insane. Um, and the third thing would be a passion for consuming, and by consuming I mean learning. Mm -hmm. And I'm blessed that I get to meet so many different founders and meet so many startups and meet guys like you, um, because every time I talk to you and every time I talk to them, I get to meet, I get to learn about them, I get to learn about 
their experiences, their lessons, mm -hmm. or you know the new crazy things going on in the industry. Mm -hmm. uh, and if you don't have those three things, you'll never make it. I'm 100% sure. Interesting. Uh, in an idea, I, I'm honestly of the belief um, that you bet on people. Uh, and so if you have an insanely good team around you, I think you can make a C-grade idea work, I agree. personally. But, as a generalization, you need to be solving something people actually need solved. Um, so if you're going to come and pitch to me some sort of find a cheaper restaurant app, I'm going to be uninterested as soon as I see that email. Mm. Um, but if you send me a story about how your grandma's terminally ill and you want to do X, Y, Z and she has 10,000, you know, there's 10,000 of those people in that situation and you think you've got something that can solve it, I'll see you yesterday for a coffee. Mm. It's interesting. Last question before we finish up. There's people at all different stages, people, entrepreneurs that we're working with, right through to people that are just starting out. What do you think classes someone as an entrepreneur? Like, is it just because you, you've got people that are in Little Tokyo Two community that probably haven't figured out exactly what they want to do yet? They might be dabbling in, in, in lots of different things. So, when is someone technically an entrepreneur, and when? What classes are starting? Like, how how do people if they don't have the idea yet? How do people get involved in becoming an entrepreneur when they don't even know what that means and they don't have the idea just yet to do it, but they really want to do it? They just don't know what. What do, you, what do you do? For me, the best word that could describe an entrepreneur is resourcefulness. Being able to make something out of nothing, or I think, yeah, the number one, yeah, the number one word would be resourcefulness. But the number one, like, attribute to support that would be strategic agility. Mm. And I would say that that means being able to think on your feet uh, and be able to change, chop and change between meetings and so on, and be completely relevant at that time all the time. Mm -hmm. You can, however, get to a dangerous stage, uh, probably like me, where you pretty much wing everything, um, even like speaking gigs, don't tell anyone. Um, but I think they're, they're the two. And if you're really looking to start something on your own, what I would suggest is if you have a parent or a friend or whomever, that's involved in some sort of industry and you talk to them enough about a problem they're facing or a connection who's trying to start something, I would get involved like that. Mm -hmm. I would, you know, start from the source of which you already can find the connections, the mentorship and the access into that industry. So start with what you know. Is it God, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, I only invest in things I know a, a lot about or think I can help mm -hmm. through my direct connections. Yes, yes. Thanks very much, mate. Very, very awesome story. Um, there's been Jock Fairweather from Little Tokyo 2 uh, for our first founder story. Thanks very much, mate. Who knows?